Hey, welcome back, everyone. Well, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, well, and I'm wondering too, what the heck was China doing flying a balloon over the United States? And frankly, the narratives coming out don't quite line up. Uh, I've actually dug into some information and Epic Times as well. It looks like the Chinese Communist Party was testing systems to launch hyperglide, uh, sorry, was it hypersonic glide missiles using balloons? And they have entire programs on it, including videos of it, I'll show you. Um, this is very similar, those of you familiar with like Cold War history, to Reagan's Star Wars strategy, where Ronald Reagan was talking about putting, you know, former President Ronald Reagan, was talking about putting nuclear warheads in space, in orbit. If you do that, it's game over. Uh, it basically means you can either detonate from, from space or near space, uh, which could destroy a nation using EMP, or you can drop it at such a speed that it cannot be intercepted. Uh, the CCP was developing this technology, or is, is developing this technology. They have videos of it. I'll be showing you these. We'll be going over it. And some other concerning stuff come out as, came out as well, which is the Pentagon really looked like it was getting involved in politics. The Pentagon came out and was, you know, suggesting that, tr that uh, there were other incidents when Trump was president where, you know, the Chinese Communist Party had flown balloons over America. It turns out they never alerted Trump or they didn't even know about it. Maybe it never even happened. This is deeply concerning. I'd say actually more so, in my opinion, because if Trump was not aware of it, if Trump wasn't told about this, that either means that, one, the military was concealing information from the President of the United States who would be able to give the shoot-down orders, or two, it means that the CCP was able to do this undetected. Uh, wild stuff, folks. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into the first story. We'll go into this, a few other things. We'll also be talking about euthanasia in Canada, how doctors are saying they've been forced to participate. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. Are we not up on Epic TV right now? Very strange. Uh, we'll keep going. I, I assume it is uh, going to be there, and so I do apologize to all of you. All right, folks, that's uh, the jump into the first story. Uh, first off, we have here the one about the balloons. I want to go deep into this and show you some of the different programs around this. Epic Times reports this. Balloon with three hypersonic missiles tested in, tested by China in 2018. And it says this stunning footage displays a high altitude balloon not dissimilar from the one that traversed over the United States last week, carrying three hypersonic glide vehicles or HGVs into high altitude and dropping them for testing. Chinese state broadcaster CCTV, one of the main state run media of the Chinese Communist Party, by the way, reported on the weapons tests in, in September of 2018. The footage has since been deleted from Chinese media. So the CCP you know, tried to erase the history of what it was doing with this. But photographs and a short clip of it, other clips as well, can be found online still, which we actually located and we have here for you. In one post from 2018, a Twitter user shared footage from Dao Yin, China's version of TikTok, which shows the balloon lifting the three HGVs, hypersonic glide vehicles, from the ground. HGVs are generally launched by rockets in a similar manner to traditional missiles. And upon reaching orbit, or in this case, I think high Earth orbit, I can't remember which, the HGVs detach from the rocket and fly through the atmosphere using their own momentum. Such weapons are much faster than other missiles while they're in low orbit, but become much slower upon hitting the dense air of the atmosphere. They have no jets to power them. The three HGVs dropped by the balloon and the footage appear to have been designed to test this phenomenon specifically, it seems. It says the balloon dropped HGVs were part of an effort to develop precision warheads for hypersonic weapons according to the South China Morning Post. And it says Paul Crespo, president of the Center for American Defense Studies, said that the balloon which traversed U.S. airspace this week could absolutely, the one that just flew over the United States, that balloon, could absolutely have been a test for this. He said it could have been a dry run for an attack using a balloon-mounted weapon, but that hypersonic missiles would likely not be a first choice for China's uh, communist regime. And he said, quote, while China has tested hypersonic missiles launched from balloons in the past, this likely, this isn't likely, you, this isn't a likely use for these airships. He said the biggest threat is sending one or more of these high altitude balloons over the U.S. with small nuclear EMP devices. 
Remember, we're talking about EMPs or electromagnetic poles. Um, everyone was talking before, at least it was pretty broadly discussed, the concern that the Chinese Communist Party was going to use essentially these balloons for an EMP attack. Uh, electromagnetic pulse, which wipes out the electric grid of a country. Sorry, folks, we still not on Epic TV. I do apologize for y'all. Um, but further when it says this, right? That basically that would be detonated at extremely high altitude. They could knock out power and communications across the U.S., wreaking havoc for a year or more without firing a shot on the ground. And as we actually mentioned in another story, I believe actually Roman did something on it just recently. Uh, an EMP would is estimated to possibly kill about 90% of the American population. Not because the EMP blast itself would be deadly, but because the aftermath of it would be deadly. Um, basically, the elimination of emergency services, the end of the food supply, and people, roughly one out of it, nine out of every ten people, not being able to weather such a scenario. That would be the real concern of an EMP. Not to mention an EMP attack would be followed very closely by a ground war or, you know, physical invasion. It wouldn't just be a standalone uh, type of attack. Now, that said, I want to I want to show you some other videos here. Let me show you a video, uh, the one we just talked about, in fact, that the CCP was used, uh, did, did record, in fact, of its test of these vehicles. Let me open this up for you. This is on Twitter, actually. This video shows the CCP weapons platform using balloons, uh, which they plan to use as basically launch platforms for missiles. In this case, hypersonic glide vehicles. Let me play this for you. Anyways, there you have it. Um, you can't really see it, but it attached, they have, uh, further into the testing, they have attached three different missiles to the end of that little rope. Um, some people compared this actually to another weapons test program that's being done by Japan. I believe back in 20, yeah, 2015. It was called the Descend program. And let me show you the Descend program, uh, which was a very similar weapons test done, again, by the Japanese in Europe, actually. And this is a Japanese website here, the Descend Project, fiscal year 2010 to fiscal year 2015. And it says, drop test for simplified evaluation of non-symmetrical distributed sonic boom, or Descend. Now, before I go into this, let me explain why this matters so much. The Chinese Communist Party was developing weapons platforms using balloons as platforms to, you know, basically drop weapons on a country. This could be used to, for example, drop a nuclear weapon. Um, it could be used to drop a hypersonic glide missile, which could strike different targets. Remember, one of the problems the CCP has is even though it does have hypersonic glide missiles, um, including anti-ship weapons that could allegedly sink, uh, allegedly sink even aircraft carriers, it would be hard for them to deploy those in close enough proximity to actually, you know, really hit anything of value in the United States, or at least in the U.S. heartland. Using this type of technology, this could be used for just about anything. Um, and even more so than that, the possibility of them using this to carry nuclear weapons, or even just the nuclear, you know, core, essentially, uh, to launch a, an EMP attack on the United States. Now, the problem we have with this is that the Pentagon was telling Biden not to shoot down this, this uh, balloon, right? The Pentagon was telling Biden, don't do it. And Biden pretty much over overrode the Pentagon and shot down the balloon once it had you know, traveled most of the United States. The, the concern with this is that the Pentagon would have known that these types of weapons platforms exist. The Pentagon would have intelligence knowing that the CCP was developing these weapons using balloons just like the one we saw, that the Japanese were developing these kinds of weapons, and even the United States was talking about developing these types of weapons, which I'll show you in a bit. In other words, they knew this was not just basically a spy balloon. 
Uh, this was a penetration test of American airspace using a weapons platform, or something that could be weaponized in this case. Back to the Descend pro project, let me show you this. It says the, that Descend, the one that was being tested by Japan in Europe, is a, pro is a project to demonstrate and evaluate low sonic boom design technology to reduce sonic boom, which is one of the highest priority issues for realizing silent supersonic transport. Our goals are, one, to demonstrate and validate JAXA's low sonic boom design concept through flight tests, and two, to establish an aerial sonic boom measurement method that can contribute to the currently ongoing deliberation of international standards for sonic booms. Further in its states, in each phase, sonic booms are measured using an aerial boom measurement system with microphone systems installed along the line to a tethered blimp. These drops, these drop tests are performed at the Estrange Space Center in Sweden, where we can secure both a safe testing environment and balloon control technologies necessary to carry test bodies. Now, understand why this matters. This was a this was a project by Japan to test sonic booms and to basically um, use the use balloon launched missile platforms as a way to address the sonic boom of a hyperglide vehicle, a supersonic vehicle in this case, very similar to the hypersonic vehicles being used by the Chinese Communist Party, i.e. missiles, right? Weapons. This was not necessarily a weapons test. Well, I guess it technically was a weapons test. Uh, but this was this was Japan demonstrating the capabilities, aside from the sonic boom test, of what a balloon-launched missile system could do. That a balloon-launched missile system could, you know, basically drop a missile with enough with enough force to produce a sonic boom. Let me show you an image here, just so you can see what the platform looks like. This was the Japanese platform, but if you if you remember. The video we just showed you of the Chinese platform, it's basically the same technology. And the CCP might have even learned from that, in fact. Remember, the, the Japanese test was done between 2010 and 2015. The Chinese Communist Party's missile test using almost an identical platform uh, with its hypersonic glide vehicles, that was done in 20, uh, 2018. So the Chinese test was done three years at least after after this Japanese test, and you can see again uh, the imagery, the technology is is, is very similar. Uh, it's very similar to what they were doing. Let me show you a video now of how this works, because remember the the balloon that flew over the United States, uh, the the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the United States, was near space or high Earth orbit. Right, uh, this was very high up. And I'll show you how that can be weaponized, what that really means. Um, I'll get into the quote-unquote rods from God weapon system the United States was talking about as well, which is uses the same technology. But let me show you first some videos of the Japanese concept for this type of missile launch system using balloons. I'll pull it up for you. balloon at an altitude of about 30 kilometers. During freefall, it reaches supersonic speed and generates sonic booms. I'll play two parts for you. On July 24th, 2015. To give the airplane enough energy. Well, there you go. That is a balloon system used to use basically as a launching platform for a missile. Um, again, that was done three years at least before the launch of the Chinese test, which had three missiles attached to it. And understand now the significance of the CCP flying balloons over U.S. airspace, uh, which could, in this case, be weaponized using the same platforms. Remember, I said one thing you would, one, one thing the CCP, the two things I believe the CCP was doing with the weather balloon, well, call it the weather balloon, uh, doing with the spy balloon, they call it a weather balloon. 
Um, I said it was one of two things. Either it was one more of like it was meant to send a message that it was a fear factor thing, or two, it was it was for intel gathering. Um, if it was for a weapon system, it would have been done for intel gathering. They wanted to see how the United States would react to a balloon like this flying into U.S. airspace. They want to see how long the response times are, how long it took for the uh, president's office to respond, how long it took for it to be detected, uh, and then what the protocols are for basically intercepting it. What the CCP has now witnessed is they were able, able to fly one of these balloons all across U.S. airspace before it was intercepted. That if they if that thing was armed with an EMP, it would have been perfectly situated right in the center of the United States and could have carried out one of those attacks if they wanted it to. Now, given that, um, of course, this, the United States would have additional ability to detect, let's say, the equipment being carried on the craft, uh, meaning that had they put something on it, unless it had some kind of technology to evade U.S. sensors, um, we would have maybe reacted differently. But again, that's a, that's, an hype, that's a hypothetical at this point because we don't actually know. Uh, we don't actually know if the military would report it, if they would react in the same way, or even if they would be able to detect it. And this is even more concerning because there were some previous reports now coming out, uh, well, new reports coming out that the Pentagon allegedly detected platforms like this when Trump was still president, and the president's office was never alerted. Only the president would have would have been able to give the firing orders to knock down a weapon system like this, uh, which is which is really concerning, uh, suggesting either the Pentagon is lying recently, or that they knowingly concealed national defense information from the president of the United States, such that again, um, it was it was pretty dang serious. Uh, let me sh let me show you something else though first. Because we're talking about these types of weapon systems, right? Uh, near space weapons or space-based missile launch platforms. These are massively effective. There was a U.S. program that would not even use missiles. It would launch giant rods, like basically giant metal cables from space. And these would be able to produce basically miniaturized meteor strikes. That is how powerful these weapons would be. The weapon system the United States was developing using a very similar platform, they called it the Rods from God, or Space Darts program. Let me show you this. This is popular science way back in 2004 on the Rods from God platform. Um, notably, they allegedly never carried this out. But let me show you this, and then I'll talk about why this matters so much. So this is popular science. This is an article from 2004. Basically, again, the impact, this, let me emphasize what this means. They would essentially have what looks like a satellite in space or near space. It would be able to, because it's not quite in space, it would be able to drop metal rods with no type of, you know, propulsion system. They don't have rockets attached to them. They're just dropping a metal rod from space all the way to the earth. The metal rod would fall with, with such force that it would replicate a localized um, it would rep, rep, it would replicate a localized meteor strike. The impact of that would be like like a miniaturized nuclear bomb. It would hit with such force. That was the concept. Now understand what it would mean if these if these rods from God, you know, quote unquote, were not even just metal rods, but metal rods attached with explosive munitions. Imagine the force it would have if it were if it was a weaponized space base or near space platform, uh, much like the CCP was testing, and much like they could have done exactly with the balloon they flew across the United States. Popular science had this to say back in two thousand four. It said this technology is very far out in miles and years. A pair of satellites orbiting several hundred miles above the Earth would serve as a weapon system. One functions as the targeting and communications platform, while the other carries numerous tungsten rods up to 20 feet in length and a foot in diameter that it can drop on targets with less than 15 minutes notice. When instructed from the ground, the targeting satellite commands its partner to drop one of its darts. 
the guided rods enter the atmosphere projected by a protected i mean by a thermal coating traveling at 36,000 feet per second comparable to the speed of a meteor the result complete devastation of the target even if it's buried deep underground and it says the two platform configuration permits the weapon to be reloaded by just launching a new set of rods rather than replacing the entire system that is what the united states was looking into in terms of weaponizing platforms exactly what like what the ccp just tested or not exactly but very similar to it and let me show you something else now whether the CCP meant to or not, um, its platform test and what it just did created a lot of controversy right here in the United States. And this is becoming more of a political topic right now, and questions are being raised over why did the Biden administration not respond sooner. Interestingly, the Pentagon is trying, it's not the role of the Pentagon, in my opinion, to do this, but they're trying to politicize it. And the Pentagon is saying, well, it wasn't just Biden, Trump ignored it too, and it turns out the Pentagon apparently withheld this information from Trump and didn't even tell him as the president, uh, which raises serious national security concerns and others. This is, I mean, justifiably now becoming a major political topic in the United States. Mem members of Congress are now looking into it and questions are coming and, you know, basically onto Biden's desk now saying, why did you not react sooner? Why did you wait for it to fly all across America? Um, you know, basically what's going on here. And so he's being forced now to address this, including in the State of the Union. Let me show you this. Uh, this is the GOP on this, the Republican Party. Newsmax had this, and it says, GOP to announce balloon probe on same day as State of the Union. So the Republicans are going to be launching basically their own investigation into this. Which is very likely going to get as well into how the Pentagon was withholding this type of information. But let me show you this first. Uh, and folks, by the way, um, I'm sorry about... So basically, those of you, I guess you're only watching on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Uh, we're having issues on Epoch TV. Uh, so we will... I'll do the full episode on Epoch... Sorry, on YouTube today and uh, Rumble, uh, Twitter, Facebook. So we're not going to cut today. I'll do the full episode here. Um, I do apologize. I don't know what's going on with Epic TV today. Um, maybe we can mention in the chat on Epoch TV too, just to tell them. Um, so folks, yeah, I don't know what's going on with Epoch TV. I really apologize for this. Oh wait, no, we are back on Epoch TV. I apologize. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we will though, we will though, uh, do the full live still on YouTube Rumble. So, uh, we, we will not cut the episode today. Um, I apologize for the technical issues. All right, that said, let's jump into what I was talking about with the State of the Union and then the Republicans launching a probe into this now, and I'm going to talk about why that matters. But let me show you Newsmax first. They said this, The Biden administration has faced criticism from Republicans over its handling of a Chinese spy balloon that entered U.S. airspace. Now Republicans are weighing probing the matter, adding to their list of already pending investigations into the administration. And it says, news, House Republicans are discussing moving a resolution that criticized the Biden administration for an action on the Chinese surveillance balloon, political reporter Olivia Beavers tweeted Saturday. And Beavers pointed out, quote, my leadership source says it pulled, said they pulled the trigger, said if they pull the trigger, it would likely hit the floor on Tuesday. So by next week or maybe today. And it says the GOP announcement of another probe into the Biden administration would fall on Tuesday, the same day as the President's State of the Union address. That'd be today, actually, right? Amid Republicans ostensibly calling for such an investigation, Representative Michael McCall, Republican from Texas, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, said on Saturday that he would, quote, be de demanding answers and will hold the administration accountable for this embarrassing display of weakness. U.S. officials were reportedly aware of the balloon's presence in American airspace since January 28. So apparently, um, that balloon was there for a very long time. There was no reaction on it from our military, none that we were aware of at least. No reaction on it uh, from the Biden administration. The public wasn't even fully told about it. Um, I don't know how it was even spotted. You remember there were some people on Twitter posting videos saying, what is that? And people were taking videos of what looked like this 
kind of like a miniature moon in the sky, and that raised some concerns over what the heck is flying over the United States. And sure enough, it turned out to be a Chinese, probably a weapons platform or a spy balloon. And then the Biden administration was forced to acknowledge it and discuss it. That is, if the Biden administration, the Biden administration was even alerted, uh, because as we're finding out now, the Pentagon claims they knew about previous incidents and did not even tell the president of the United States, Donald Trump, at the time. Um, this is going to be a serious investigation, folks. Uh, I think this is going to be pretty pretty big once this does come out. We'll see, though. Axio says this because Biden is now being forced to address this. And it says China crashes Biden's State of the Union. Um, presumably, Biden will not be doing his kind of, uh, you know, red speech again, where he's talking about domestic extremism, maybe not as much. He now has to talk about, well, very likely talk about the Chinese Communist Party threat to the United States. Axio says this, China will be an uninvited guest at President Biden's State of the Union address Tuesday night, as he takes credit for a resilient economy, celebrates record low unemployment, and previews a broader domestic agenda designed to unify the country. <laughs> Hopefully that means unify and not demonize half the country, but we'll see. It says, why it matters. The stakes are high for Biden as he emphasizes a series of accomplishments and tries to control the narrative about his administration as it faces investigations by House Republicans. Now, a balloon from China has complicated that. Biden and his speechwriters are prepared to be nimble and very likely rewrite China's sections of the speech, as officials weigh Beijing's response to the U.S. military's downing of the surveillance balloon after it drifted across North America. The president's challenge is to signal to Beijing that violating American airspace will not be tolerated, while also convincing Americans and skeptical, skeptical Republicans that he did enough to protect U.S. airspace. Biden said on Wednesday he ordered the balloon to be shot down and that national security officials thought it was the safest to, to wait until it was over water, meaning until it had gone across the entire United States. Um, I'll get into that in a moment. It says Biden also wants to preserve his administration's ability to cooperate with China on everything from the global economy to climate change. So it looks like Biden, it looks like Biden is going to criticize the CCP to an extent, maybe condemn this, and also celebrate his actions of ordering the shooting down of the uh, the Chinese Communist Party balloon. That being said, though, at least according to Axios, it looks like Biden wants to keep some doors open with the Chinese Communist Party, including to cooperate on, uh, you know, green energy platforms, a ridiculous statement because the CCP doesn't cooperate on that. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party typically is left out of requirements when it comes to, let's say, cutting greenhouse gas emissions and so on. Maybe they'll agree to something like 10 years down the road. And, you know, basically, while other countries are dismantling their energy systems, the Chinese Communist Party is building them like there's no tomorrow. And by doing so, gaining an international monopoly on energy, which, remember, can be used for uh, deep control programs, including politically, uh, which was what Russia was doing during the Obama administration, which was why, again, it was so controversial when Hillary Clinton, through the Uranium One deal when she was Secretary of State, handed off uh, United U.S. nuclear sovereignty to Russia. Because remember, the intel at the time was saying Russia was planning to buy up international energy and then use that as a political weapon against the West. Remember that, right? Now... We'll see where it goes. I, I did mention in yesterday's episode, the Biden administration, to their credit, has actually taken some pretty strong stances against the Chinese Communist Party. They've maintained a lot of the Trump-era sanctions against the CCP, and most importantly, they actually really advanced, not only maintained Trump's policy, but advanced his policy going after semiconductors, which the chip bans basically dismantle the entire Chinese Communist Party high-tech economy and basically pull the teeth out of its military. Um, huge development, which I covered in yesterday's episode, which I will, not, I will not go further into today. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy over why Biden waited so long to shoot down the weapons platform, and people are wondering why the military, the Pentagon, was telling Biden not to shoot it down, why they were advising not to do it. 
I do think there are um, I do think there are some real concerns with this, which I'll get into in a minute. But to their credit, uh, to their credit, there are other there's other, another side to this. I just want to make sure I'm covering all sides here. To their credit, basically, basically, there's two elements they would be looking for with this spy balloon. One was it carrying weapons? Was it was it a kinetic threat to the United States? Was it carrying an EMP? Was it carrying missiles? Was it carrying something else? The military said no such intelligence. Based on their uh, based on their assessment, they seem to be very confident in that. And sure enough, they they were right in the end, at least based on what we know. Uh, the the platform did not launch any kind of weapon that we're aware of. And basically, as the as the U.S. military said, there was no real threat from that. Right, so the weapons threat was not there based on U.S. military assessment. They would have sensors to be able to detect most of those things. Um, again, leaving out the small possibility that they, that it might have had something we could not detect. Who knows? It was based on this that they advised to not shoot down the platform, right? Not shoot down this balloon because they believed that at least this is what the military was saying. They believed that it would it would pose a civilian harm that the balloon could come crashing down on a major U.S. you know maybe a house or maybe a hunter in the woods or maybe a small town or something like that, and that the risk to human life would not be worth basically you know basically what we'd gain by shooting it down. That's one side of it. The actual military, the kinetic threat, right? Number two would be the intel gathering threat. The intel gathering threat would be that a spy balloon was flying across the United States. The spy balloon was allegedly trying to scoop up da data and was flying over sensitive U.S. nuclear weapons facility sites. That is, of course, of, of serious concern. The military claimed that it was taking steps to conceal any type of valuable information from that satellite. And, you know, people were kind of like, well, can they really do that, right? I'll get into that in a second. The third issue would be that they were trying to probe U.S. responses, and from that perspective, not responding according to normal protocol would actually be a better course of action. And so maybe maybe if normal protocol would be to wait until the thing traversed the entire United States before shooting it down, maybe that was a good move, uh, because it does not give them what they wanted. It does not show them the normal reaction process if we believe there was a legitimate military threat. That being said, now back to the idea of gathering information, because that's the real big narrative. Why did we let a spy balloon fly across the United States? Why would we let that happen, right, aside from everything else, right? Why would we let that happen? Well, the military was claiming they were hiding stuff, but more so than that, if you remember, I mentioned that when it comes to electronic warfare, um, including capabilities even the CCP has, you can deny the collection of information to a platform. You can also alter the data being collected by a platform. Um, I know, for example, when I was doing research on the Chinese military, uh, previously a lot of their military operations were under the general staff department. If you remember when Obama sanctioned, or sorry, put out arrest warrants for members of the Chinese hacker army, that was the General Staff Department, 3rd Department, specifically Unit 61398. Um, General Staff Department, 3rd Department was signals intelligence, very close to what we would have like with the NSA. 2nd Department would have been human intelligence, like conventional spies, more like CIA-ish, um, although they would have their other branches similar to that. Uh, and then there was the mysterious 4th Department, which nobody really talked about, and the 4th Department was electronics warfare. Now, keep in mind, those capabilities have since been moved under the strategic support force of the Chinese military. But, you know, beside the point, right? The 4th Department at the time worked on things like satellite warfare. And that, again, satellite warfare, not just on building capabilities, for example, to shoot down or disable satellites, but to also engage in information war targeting satellites. Um, including altering information as it is entering or leaving a satellite platform. Using different types of electronic warfare, you can actually alter information. Keep in mind the way that information technology works. Um, typically, it works through electromagnetic field, um, the spectrum of light, right? 
And of course, there's different frequencies of light as there are different frequencies of sound. Uh, typically, you know, for example, 5G works on a certain electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, when you talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? The, the, the different bandwidths or the different spectrums of, sorry, not bandwidths, the different spectrums of light. Now, there are military platforms and existing technologies through which you could alter information within the electromagnetic field, altering information traveling through that spectrum or collect it, right? Um, and that gets into electronic warfare. I mentioned that the United States, the CCP can do that. I mean, at least they claim. The United States is much more capable. And you might remember when this was first happening, I was mentioning the electronic warfare capabilities of the United States and how basically they could, they could based on our, our, our capabilities, either, either deny entirely the capture of data by a platform similar to that, or alter the data it is collecting. And it turns out the military is claiming that's exactly what they did um, now after it's over. Let me show you this. This is Twitter. And it says, notable, U.S. officials say they were able to block the balloon from gathering intel during its overflight of the U.S. while the military was able to turn the tables, so to speak, to gather intel on the balloon and its equipment. Remember I mentioned they have scanning technology that would allow them to see the contents of the balloon, to know the components, and to also deny the collection of information. That's what they did to the balloon. Um, so it, 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 it worked out kind of as I mentioned although again this does raise the issue of what they were doing with it um, again i do think it was penetration testing and also sending a message uh, penetration testing again being a concern in this case because the ccp has built weapon platforms using something just like this meaning based on the intelligence they're gathering on u.s responses they would know how they would get more details on how they could weaponize a platform like that for what could be a massively devastating attack on the united states that being said, folks, let's go deeper into this. Because the Pentagon now is on the hot seat, and as Congress looks into Trump, and while Trump's, well, as, as Congress looks into Biden, I'm sorry, and Biden's slow reaction time on this, why did he wait for it to traverse the entire United States? Why did the Pentagon advise not to shoot it down? Why was it able to be there from late January and only now do they do something about it? When were they going to tell the American people? When were they going to alert the president? Well, it turns out the Pentagon did something very strange. While the Biden administration was facing pressure, the Pentagon, our military, comes out and says basically this, well, don't blame Biden, don't blame the, don't blame the Democrats because Trump and the Republicans did the same thing. That is very strange behavior for the military. The military, by doing this, is engaging in political operations domestically. The military, by doing this, is trying to protect one political party from scrutiny while trying to attack another political party. And given the concerns over the weaponization of our government and the politicization of the different branches of government, this looks like the politicization of the military. But then it blew up in their faces. It absolutely blew up in their faces because it turns out, hey, yeah, this happened under Trump, or at least they say it did. But guess what? The military concealed that information from the President of the United States, which could be a serious, a serious concern when it comes to national security. Let me show you. I'll start by with, I'll start with the controversy and how it developed. Basically, the Pentagon got involved in this whole thing. And Daily Mail reported this as Trump was facing criticism for it. It says, Trump denies China flew spy balloons across the U.S. during his administration, despite the Pentagon claiming Beijing sent three. This looks bad on Trump. Uh-oh, they got him again. Or not. Uh, it says, ex-president compares the diplomatic crisis to Biden's Afghanistan withdrawal. So Trump was criticizing Biden for this. The Pentagon came to Biden's rescue and then tried attacking Trump, and then it blew up in their faces. But let me show you. It says Donald Trump claimed China would have never sent a spy balloon over the United States on his watch, despite the Pentagon claiming it happened three times during his administration. This looks very bad on Trump, right? 
Further in its state, the Defense Department said on Saturday that Chinese balloons briefly trans transited the continental United States at least three times during the prior administration. Look at that, traversed the United States. They flew across the entire country, they're claiming. And on, sun and on Sunday, Fox News reported that at least one balloon flew over parts of Texas and Florida while Trump was in office. Multiple officials, aside from the former president, have also disputed the Pentagon's assessment and relevant media reports. They were, they were disputing it because they were never told about it, it turns out. At least that's what we're seeing now. Let me show you one of these responses. John Ratcliffe said this. He said the, shoot, the shooting down claim that three, he basically shot down claims that three of these balloons had traversed the United States. Daily Wire had the story, and he said former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, rejected the claim that three Chinese spy balloons transited the United States during Donald Trump's presidency. And Ratcliffe said this, it's true, I can, it's not true, I'm sorry, I can refute it. And he insisted the American people can refute the Biden administration's claims for themselves. He said this, do you remember during the Trump administration when photographers on the ground and commercial airline pilots were talking about a spy balloon? Uh, over, uh, a spy balloon over the United States that people could look up and see with, that, with the naked eye, and that the media that hated Donald Trump was not reporting? I don't remember that either, because it did not happen. What he's suggesting is that had this happened while Trump was president, the media would have attacked Trump, the intelligence community probably would have attacked him, maybe Democrats would have tried to impeach Trump over it, uh, because that's what they typically did any time a new any time anything happened that they wanted to use politically and try to blame on him, right? That was just the way they operated. It was constant crisis. Trump was uh, orange Hitler, whatever they were claiming he was, and everything was the biggest crisis on earth, and everything warranted basically trying to impeach the president of the United States. We didn't hear any of that, um, and John Ratcliffe saying based on that. You know, if, if, if Trump had ignored three different Chinese weapons or intelligence platforms flying across the entire United States, uh, they would have used it. They would have absolutely politicized that. Would have, they would have tried to go after Trump for it, and they did not. And based on that, he's saying the whole thing was bunk. The whole thing was fake. At least the Pentagon right now is saying this. And then something interesting happened, folks. The Pentagon is now saying, actually, it did happen when Trump was president. Actually, this did, in fact, happen, but they never told him. Trump was never alerted. Now, there's two possibilities with this. One is that the Pentagon is telling the truth, that three Chinese spy balloons, or maybe who knows what they were, maybe weapons platforms even, flew across the United States and they did not alert the president of the United States, or two, it means that they made the whole thing up, and they were basically trying to save Biden from criticism by making up lies against Trump. Uh, this is going to be something they need to investigate, because at this point, we don't know which is true. But let me show you this. Fox News had it. It says, Chinese spy balloons over U.S. during Trump admin discovered after he left office, according to a senior Biden official. And let me, I'll go into why this matters so much in a minute as well. It says further in on Sunday, a senior administration official told Fox News Digital that, quote, U.S. intelligence, not the Biden administration, assessed that PRC, People's Republic of China, government surveillance balloons transited the continental U.S. briefly at least three times during the prior administration and once that we know of at the beginning of this administration under Biden, the one we just saw. It says, but never for this duration of time. The official told Fox News that, quote, this information, and it wasn't just Fox, CNN had the story as well, just emphasizing this was not a partisan claim. It says they went undetected, right? The official told Fox News this information was discovered after the Trump administration left. They went undetected, the official told Fox News, and the official explained that Chinese surveillance balloons are part of a larger platform. These balloons, quote, are all part of a PRC, People Republic of China, fleet of balloons developed to conduct surveillance operations, which also, which have also violated the sovereignty of other countries. And he added that these activities are often undertaken at the direction of the People's Liberation Army, 
That means that these operations are directed by the military of the Chinese Communist Party. The PLA is the tip, technically the armed wing of the Chinese of the Chinese government, right? Well, the CCP. Um, te te technically, the government would be the state council, uh, but the CCP controls that as well, right? It's a, co it's a communist system. Now, why does that matter? Because what they're saying is that the balloons were discovered after Trump left office, and this just doesn't quite line up. Uh, let's be frank. Why does it not line up? Let me explain. They're saying, how, how do you retroactively detect something? Right? You either detect it or you do not detect it. Meaning the Chinese Communist Party flew these balloons over the United States. I mean, unless they go back and look at like Intel data and like, oh, what is this? It means these balloons flew across the United States and they either detected them or they did not. How do you retroactively detect something? What that means is one of two things. Either they're lying and they're trying to politicize this to try to make an aha moment against Trump to protect Biden, meaning the politicization of the Department of, of Defense, which is a serious issue. Two, it means that, uh, or two, it means that they lied to the President of the United States or concealed serious national security threats from the President of the United States and did not allow the President to give the orders to shoot it down as Biden just did meaning that they were withholding critical national security um, information from the president. Either way, it's a big deal. Either way, this is serious. The third possibility I will mention for their credit uh, would be that maybe that maybe censors detected it and just nobody noticed until afterwards. If that is the case, I would actually be even more concerned because if they detected it and nobody noticed, that means they could have flown one of the, that probably means they could have flown one of these, um, you know, weapons platforms we discussed and basically had it not be noticed by our defense department. That means that the CCP doing penetration testing, intelligence gathering, flying a balloon over the United States that could work as a weapons platform being run by the PRC, the CCP, under the direction of the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army. That means they would basically have information suggesting they can fly a dangerous and seriously devastating, if it was armed, weapons platform over the United States, and our military would not even notice, and even if they did notice, they would not even tell the President of the United States to give him the opportunity to order that it be shot down. Um, this is going to be serious grounds for an investigation now. Um, frankly, the story went from being kind of, you know, a big deal and something that made Biden kind of look bad, to being something that gives the Republicans, I think, exactly what they were looking for, which is evidence of the politicization of the Department of Defense, and evidence that that politicization of the Department of, of Defense is posing a serious national security threat to the country. Meaning people are going to be investigated, and the people being investigated are going to be looked into from a national security lens. Uh, that their dereliction of duty, possibly, or they're, I don't know, maybe some other connect, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they were secretly communicating with the Chinese Communist Party behind the president's back, like John Milley, you know, like Milley, right? Um, it, it's pretty dang serious, folks, right? Remember Milley, I'm, I'm, half, I'm half being tongue-in-cheek here, but remember General Milley uh, said that he was communicating with the Chinese Communist Party behind the back of the U.S. president when Trump was president? Um Put two and two together, that's good. that becomes a much bigger issue. Again, all right, if, jo if John Milley was communicating with the People's Republic of China, if he was communicating with them on a military level, because he was a, he's a general, right? And if during that time the Chinese Communist Party was flying military-led, People's Liberation Army-led, military-led weapons platforms over the United States, and Milley and others, if I don't know if he was aware of it, but... They, you know, again, this would be around the same time frame. That you're getting into really serious criminal a criminal accusation territory against high-ranking members of the U.S. military. Um, if if this is true, and I think you're going to watch these types of investigations, I do think the Republicans are going to go there uh, in terms of looking into this. 
And really, I think we're going to hear a lot more about this over the next few months, alongside the full picture of everything else we're looking into. Um, this is just the start of it, folks. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal, actually. Um, sorry, Mark Milley, not John Milley. That, that's uh, General Mark Milley, who admitted that he was communicating with the CCP behind the backs of the U.S. president. Now, that being said, there's a bit more to this. And the Pentagon now is actually admitting it. The Pentagon now is conceding some of this. And the Pentagon is claiming that it was a, quote, awareness gap. How do you become retroactively aware, right? They were aware or they were not aware. Which one is it? Did they, did they lie, right? Are they even telling the truth? We don't know. How do you have an awareness gap? And retroactively, then you say, oh, by the way, three PLA uh, spy balloons flew over America. We, we were going to tell you, uh, but we were too busy talking to the Chinese military uh, behind the backs of the president at that time. You know, sorry about that, right? Providing national security information to them, by the way, uh, which is also probably just as serious. You could, you could be executed for that in some countries. But it says that they're saying that this awareness gap caused the failure to detect three Chinese spy balloons during the Trump year. So how is it a failure to detect it, but they claim they also detected it? How does that work? They had a failure to detect them, but they also claim they did detect them? Are you getting that? Let's go into this further. It says a top U.S. general charged with monitoring the nation's airspace said that the military did not detect previous incursions into U.S. airspace by Chinese spy balloons. But didn't they just say otherwise? Didn't they just tell us otherwise? That they detected three times? Now they're saying they did not detect them, but maybe they retroactively detected them? Regardless, right? Air Force General Glenn Van Herc who serves as commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, said that Chinese spy balloons previously went undetected on at least three occasions during the Trump administration. He says, I will tell you that we did not detect those threats, and that's a domain awareness gap. I mean, this is actually pretty serious as well, uh, if this is true. I should note, Van Herc, we, we have, I, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as I know, uh, there's no evidence that he's been politicized, and so maybe he's outside this whole thing. But if NORAD failed to detect three Chinese, you know, weapons platforms, which we can call them at this point, because they're being run by the Chinese military, that's a big deal. Especially when the CCP is, as I showed you the videos of, doing experiments on the arming of those platforms using what would be devastating weapons against the country. It says Van Herc said this during a press briefing on February 6th, and it said Van Herc said that NORAD, which is jointly operated by the United States and Canada, first detected a spy balloon on January 28th over the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, although President Joe Biden said he was not briefed on the matter until February 1st. It says the balloon was allowed to continue flying over U.S. airspace until it was shot down off the South Carolina coast on February 4th. Now... Again, I want to emphasize we don't have all the information on this. The information has been contradicting, self-contradicting. The information has been politicized. We don't know the full picture of it yet. There are going to be investigations on it. We can wait for those to come out. We'll see what Biden says tonight during the State of the Union also. Uh, but frankly, this is turning into something much bigger. And everything else aside, maybe the United States will have to do a little bit more um, to make sure that we can detect these types of weapons platforms if it does turn out they did not detect them. But again, that's inherently self-contradictory because they're both telling us they did not detect them and they're telling us they did detect them and somebody knew well enough that they did detect them to come out politically and try to make Trump look bad when Biden was being criticized for it. So it's it, the information does not line up. Somebody's lying. Somebody somewhere is lying. We don't know who that is yet, uh, but I do think some real investigations on this hopefully will show us what the heck is going on because it's it's the information is not lining up. All right, folks, that said, I want to go into something else. Um, then we'll jump into questions. So if you have questions, do leave them in the chat. And again, um, folks, I apologize that we had issues on Epic TV earlier. I don't think we've had this happen before. I don't know. I don't know what went on. We will look into it. 
Uh, but we are on YouTube still, and we're on uh, Rumble. And I know some of you are still on Epic TV, so thanks for thanks for holding down the fort. Um, again, we're not cutting today, so I, I will do the Q&A on YouTube as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll get to them. But first, I want to talk about what's happening in Canada. Because remember now, we're talking about MAIDS, this medically assisted death. A fancy way of saying, basically, your doctor is going to help the government murder you, right? The government's going to kill you. And the concern in Canada is that, you know, euthanasia or assisted suicide, while, while it's being basically framed under the narrative of, let's say, someone is, uh, you know, a la in late stage cancer and they're in constant pain or they're dealing with just, you know, life threatening disease and they're going to die anyway and they want to basically be in control of their own fate, right? that these very rare circumstances where a person is just in terrible suffering and, you know, based on that, they want to escape that suffering and they're going to die anyway. And why not let them do it? That That is the way euthanasia is normally presented. Personally, I'm against it in all cases, personally, um, because I believe once you get the government involved in the right to kill people and once you especially use doctors for the purpose of killing people, whether no matter what the form, it opens a very dangerous door, and I don't want that door open. If a person wants to end their life, I, I, I'm against suicide personally, but, you know, that, that in the end, you can only do so much to stop a person. I'm, I'm personally opposed to it. But I don't believe the government should be involved. I don't believe hospitals should be involved. And I think creating regulation that allows it, again, opens a very, very dangerous door. And we're now seeing what that very dangerous door being open looks like. Because in Canada, it's getting really bad. In Canada, it's not just people who are on life support. It's not just people who are in, you know, seriously suffering. In Canada, it's like veterans you know, wounded veterans calling up to have, a wheel, you know, this is an actual case, a woman veteran calling up to have a wheelchair ramp installed, and she's asked by, by the people she's calling, well, have you considered assisted suicide? Meaning, the government does not want to pay your medical bills, why don't you just kill yourself? The tens of thousands of people, again, you know, th sorry, thousands of people are killing themselves in Canada, using this program they're now opening it up to teenagers uh, they're opening it up to kids they're expanding it now to even just depression at which anyone who's suffered depression everybody gets sad sometimes i'm sure everybody's been through something in their life where they were depressed it doesn't mean you have a mental illness you know everybody deals with hardship sometimes and anybody who's been through anything like that for a couple of years knows that there's a there's a light at the end of the tunnel right? It doesn't last forever, even if in the moment it's hard to see out of. The services that you're usually offered will talk you out of suicide. They'll tell you something along the lines of what I just told you, that stick it out, you know, keep walking. You, sometimes you just got to grit your teeth and just keep going, and uh, you'll find that things get better. You know, things get better. And the emotional turmoil you're facing subsides. It goes away. It's not permanent. Well, uh, they're making it in Canada where if you're in a situation like that and you reach out for help, the individual you're talking to might actually try to convince you to kill yourself. They might do the exact opposite. Rather than try to save your life, they will try to end your life. And now there are doctors speaking out about it. There are doctors in Canada, and this is, again, where I talked about you open that door. You open that door of the government legally being able to kill people. And of doctors being legally able to kill people and the entire business that forms around technologies designed to kill people like these um they're even making suicide booths they they need to create products you know in lethal injection many of these are by private companies that have to make a profit and you're going to see you're already seeing advertisement campaigns promoting suicide there's a business component to it that needs to make money off killing people. That is the, the infrastructure that moves in once you open that door. And there are doctors now coming forward and they're saying they were coerced. They were facing coercion to participate in the killing of patients 
and they believe it is unethical, they believe it is illegal, they believe it is morally wrong, and they were forced into it. That is what it looks like once you open that door. And let me show you this. Epic Times says, Canada's doctors coerced into promoting euthanasia call the practice illegal and unethical. In other words, it, it can go against your moral fabric. You can, you can be talking to a patient and you believe the person is a good person, you believe that what they're going through is temporary, but the state is dictating that you need to try to convince them to kill themselves. That's what's happening in Canada, and that's what these programs look like once they go further down the road. Epic Times reports over 1,500, 1,500 of Canada's public, uh, publicly funded psychiatrists, pediatricians, medical professors, and general practitioners have joined an organization to fight the government's expansion of medical assistance in dying or made, fancy way of saying government program to kill you, in March of 2023, patients suffering from conditions such as depression, bipolar disorder, personality disorder, schizophrenia, PTSD, or any other mental affliction. You get that? Any other mental affliction. Look, if you if most of us were to go to a psychiatrist and be like, you know, Mr. Psychiatrist, I'm feeling kind of depressed today. I feel kind of sad they're going to be like, uh-oh, well, it looks like you're suffering from depression. Um, looks like you need some medication. You know, it's a business. A any kind of emotion, other than, in any kind of state, other than that, like, very narrow, perfect life, is going to be called a mental disorder. I guarantee you, almost anybody going to the, almost anybody, if you really open up your heart and talk about your hardships, they're going to say you have a problem. They're going to try to give you medication. Um, you look at the number of people on antidepressants in the United States, the number is very high. A large part of the population is on antidepressants. Imagine now if every one of those people could be killed or advised to be killed because of that. That's the ground, that's the territory we're getting into, folks. It says some, or again, or any other mental affliction, right? If you have anything... It will gain you access to lethal injection. They can kill you. I mean, if you concede to being killed, and they will try to convince you to kill yourself, as we've seen them doing. It says, some critics argue medical professionals are being pressured to promote MAID. They're being pressured to sell it like a product. Because suicide is cheaper than having to provide care under Canada's publicly funded medical system. This is the last stage of socialist medicine, is what you're looking at. Uh, you're too much of a burden on the system. The collective does not want to support the individual because the interest of the individual does not serve the interest of the collective. Uh, socialism 101, right? That the, the life of the individual, the value of the individual, is dissolved into the greater interest of the collective, the collectivist society. And if you need to be killed for the good of the people, for the good of the collective, uh, if your death will you know, help the collective be more prosperous, socialist countries have always had no problem doing that, historically. Canada now is walking down that very dangerous road. And socialist medicine, uh, again, with limited budgets where taxpayers are propping it up, does show that, again, long wait lines, even though you're not paying, those, you're not paying crazy amounts of money. Look, our, our medical system, system here is messed up too, but I, I blame that on state interventionist policies and on the broken, uh, really, on some of the broken legal systems around it. But regardless of the point, Subsidizing a broken system does not fix a broken system. Subsidizing a broken system merely maintains something that should be reformed and changed rather than doing what you need to do to reform and change it. Canada's system is broken as well. And it can't withstand it can't basically withstand the amount of demand it has. It costs too much money. And because it costs too much money, if someone needs to go on life support, if someone needs medical services, the government is it appears informing people that they should try to promote maids. At least that's what they're saying now. 
It says a group of 1,502 Canadian doctors, including medical professors and specialists, calling themselves Physicians Together with Vulnerable Canadians, or PTVC, have publicly expressed their concerns about the situation on their website. Uh, medicine, which is, has been transformed into a technological occupation. So this is what they're saying. They're stating, medicine, quote, has been transformed into a technical occupation that allows physicians to deliberately end the lives of their suffering patients. Forced participation. You're forced to kill people. You're like that doctor under the Nazis saying, I was just following orders, right? I was just following orders. Forced participation. Quote, in arranging and facilitating euthanasia and assisted suicide is now required by certain regulatory colleges. You have to do it. You're forced to do it. You no longer have a choice. Well, there's always a choice, but that choice might mean you lose your doctor's license. You might waste, you know, your entire time of going through medical school and you'll lose your job and your livelihood. But yeah, there's a choice a little bit still, right? It says, quote, patients can no longer unconditionally trust their medical professionals to advocate for their life when they are at their weakest and most vulnerable. And it says, suddenly a lethal injection becomes part of a repertoire of interventions offered to end their pain and suffering. Now, Dr. Ramona Colo, a London, Ontario-based family physician and a founding member of PTVC, this organization, said in an interview in the Ottawa Citizen that, quote, our profession has been coerced into facilitating suicide rather than preventing it. For ever increasing, for ever increasing numbers of citizens. We watch in utter dismay and horror at how the nature of our medical profession has been so quickly destroyed by the creation of misguided laws. And continues, it says, when Canada passed its first euthanasia law in 2016, folks, what, what is that, seven years? Less than seven years? And it's gone from being a very kind of basic policy to being where doctors are getting forced to participate, uh, you can see how quickly that ball rolls down that hill. Once you open that door, this is how quickly it moves. And it says the high court ruled that only competent adults initially suffering from a grievous or ir irredeemable medical position or a condition had a right to receive lethal injection. At first, it was not as extreme. Very quickly, it became very extreme. And I'll tell you what, that ball is still rapidly rolling down that hill. We have not seen the end of where it will go. They're making it available to kids now. They're making it available to anybody suffering from any kind of mental condition. And that ball is not stopping rolling. We will see where it goes next. We're already at the point where doctors are being forced to participate. We're already at the point where people are seeing commercials advertising assisted suicide. We're seeing them opening the door to most of the population now. How far are we away? We're already seeing people not even asking for it, being advised to kill themselves. At what point, now that we've seen medical tyranny, the likes of which we haven't seen since the days of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, right? Because they used a medical, the medical emergency claim there was a sickness of the people, the sickness of the Volk which justified their state of emergency and violating everything they did in terms of human rights. How far are we away before the government mandates that you go get your lethal injection? You know, they can mandate you get your clot shot. They can mandate you do whatever else. How far are we away that they can mandate this? It's not that far off, I'd say, based on the trajectory. It says there were safeguards in place, such as a 10, this is initially, there were safeguards in place, such as a 10-day wait period that allowed patients time to change their minds, and there was, an, there was an onus on the physician to provide alternative treatments to euthanasia to alleviate pain and suffering, such as government-funded palliative care programs, uh, sorry, palliative care programs. All that's gone out the window. All that is done. Because in just a few short years, this is how far it has come. Again, how far are we off where you're told that it's for the good of the it's for the good of society? Uh, you need to think about protecting grandma. Grandma, you know, needs her medical care. Who are you to eat up the cost of the medical system? 
Uh, you know, we're going to mandate that maybe 10% of the population needs to get their lethal injection, uh, or maybe they'll call it their made injection. Stuff like this, ridiculous stuff like this that we've seen already, we never thought they'd do. The, that, that concept, as ridiculous as it sounds, is not unthinkable anymore. It is no longer unthinkable that they would do this. They're, even as we speak right now, they're not forcing people to do it, but they are advising people to do it against their will. They are advising people to kill themselves against their will. We're, we're already there. Anyways, wild stuff, folks. All right, that said, let's jump into some questions. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll get to them. We can talk about anything you want, folks. You want to talk about the balloon, uh, maids. We can talk about the border, anything. You, Biden's State of the Union address. Uh, leave your questions now. Um, Enthos38, you're saying if Trump was not told about the CCP, I wonder if it's because the Pentagon thought there could be war. Well, General Milley suggested that. Um, General Milley suggested that basically he was communicating with the CCP and bypassing the president, who, by the way, is the commander-in-chief, meaning Milley was violating the chain of command. But claims he was doing that, bypassing Trump, because he believed that Trump was kind of like too aggressive and suggesting that had he gone through Trump uh, with some of the information he was seeing, that he did not believe Trump would handle it well and maybe would start a war. I will emphasize that you, you heard frequently during Trump's administration that he was going to start World War III uh, when he was you know, basically calling out North Korea and threatening them, when he was going after the CCP and you know really targeting them with trade war, that this was going to lead to World War III. Trump crossed the DMZ in North Korea and shook hands with Rocket Man and then literally gave him a copy of the tape by David Bowie of the song Rocket Man. Trump, Trump did that. <laughs> After Trump was calling Kim Jong-un Rocket Man, Trump, when he met with the guy in person, gave him a copy of the tape Rocket Man. He gave him the song, which, which is a very nice song. I, I assume he meant that as a, as a very kind gesture. Um, meaning that my point being, when it comes to the way Trump operated, he typically called people out. He said, yeah, I have a nuclear button and mine's bigger and it works. Uh, when he was going with this at, at it with the CCP, he was saying, no, you're not going to take advantage of us. We're going to find an equal deal or you're not going to get anything. And guess what? You need us a whole lot more than we need you. In fact, we probably don't even need trade with the CCP. We'd probably be better off, right? And the CCP came crawling to the negotiating table. Um, really, uh, I think I think Milley's, Milley's suggestion that he was just concerned about national security could be justified because that's the way the mili that, that's the way the media was presenting Trump. That is the way politically, especially the Democrats, were presenting Trump. And anybody who is only exposed to one side of the you know political narratives and arguments could justifiably make the argument that based on what they were hearing, they were they had concerns, right? You you could justifiably say that to his credit. Uh, but it does violate chain of command. It does violate some serious laws. It also goes against even the way the military should operate, and it could constitute some pretty serious crimes if he was ever put on trial for it, but we'll see. And given the current situation... We don't know what's going on with the military because we're hearing mixed news on mixed claims on how Trump was not alerted of the incursions into U.S. airspace by Chinese balloons. We do know that they had them. We do know that they were aware that the CCP was building them. We know they were aware the CCP was weaponizing such platforms. We do know they were aware the PLA or the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, was directly overseeing these programs. Uh, we also are aware that they claimed there were three different incursions, but we're hearing really contradictory information about that now, where they're saying, yes, we detected it, but no, we did not detect it, and no, we did not alert the president. Um, then they're coming out and saying that Trump was alerted and, you know, they're making it political. There's, there's a lot of questions that have to be answered before we draw any conclusions, uh, but that's basically where things are at, that there's something fishy going on, something weird is going on. See more butts. You're saying, Josh, has EMP technology progressed to where they can have uh, specific targets, or is it an all-out type weapon? Um, yeah, actually, there's some really advanced EMP weapons. 
um, I want to say it, it was North Northrop Grumman Northrop was demonstrating even a flyover. There's videos of it. Um, let me step back. Um, EMP means electromagnetic pulse. Um, some of the original the original experiments with EMP weapons were in the initial tests of U.S. nuclear weapons, where they were testing it, for example, in some of the islands. And they were finding that the blast not only had a devastating effect on a localized, you know, where the where the bomb was dropped, but actually destroyed electronics equipment uh, within a pretty wide with, within a pretty wide area. It turns out that what it generates is an electromagnetic pulse, um, basically going across the spectrum of light and overloading any kind of equipment uh, that does not have the kind of the ability to handle that type of electronic surge. Um, it surges it, and it, it breaks the device essentially, or, you know, locally disrupts it in such a way that breaks it, right? They found that if, if basically you were to take a weapon like that high enough over a country that the dispersed EMP blast would be enough. Like for example, in the United States, if you were to, if you were to, if you were to detonate a nuclear weapon high enough over the heartland of the United States, the EMP blast would wipe out the electric grid in the entire continental United States. And the impact of that would not only destroy satellites and destroy local, you know, ground level equipment, but would also basically disable systems necessary for the maintenance of life, uh, water treatment plants, you know, food processing facilities, uh, logistic systems, even vehicles, communications, and systems that would not be easily replaceable, that the time it would take to replace them, about nine out of every 10 Americans would very likely be dead um, within, within maybe a year or half a year. That would be the concern. Since the time of the initial experiments, remember the initial experiments on EMP blast and you know nuclear weapons, they've developed quite a bit. Uh, the CCP has programs for this. They're, they're documented under what's called the Assassin's Mace program, also called it's also translated as the Trump Card program, not not anywhere related to Donald Trump, uh, but the Trump Card or Assassin's Mace program. There are some documents on it you can read. Um, some of the few I'm aware of are older U.S. Army documents, which I, I think have been since removed from the Internet. But I've I've personally reported on it quite a few times, and I think I actually have the archive link linked in one of my articles. Um, the United States, meanwhile, has also significantly done development on this uh, to the point where, again, you know, a lot of a lot of military technology in the United States comes from private companies like Northrop and you know so on. And uh, some of these companies have demonstrated precision EMP attacks. Um, one of the one of the really interesting videos I saw several years ago was an EMP weapon that could be equipped on a fighter jet. They they have they have concept videos demonstrating it. You can probably still find them online, although you'd probably have to Google around quite a bit. Basically, it was so precise that a jet flying over a country could. Uh, precision strike and e with EMP a single building in a city and so let's say for example there was a, a sensitive server that was holding let's say monitoring technology or tar let's say let's say it's a command and control facility for uh, a foreign military a jet flies over strikes it with EMP it doesn't kill anybody there nobody dies but it destroys the electronics they've demonstrated that technology um, and, and again, that's, uh, it, it is at that level. You also have suitcase based, um, you know, miniaturized nuclear weapons technology that our adversaries, unfortunately do have, uh, that could also from a ground level being carried by an individual, maybe across the porous U S Mexico border, uh, could also launch such an attack using a miniaturized nuclear weapons or, or even like a briefcase type um, EMP, which could even work in ways that does not necessarily need a nuclear blast. Um, yes, so the technology is very advanced. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the greater threats to the United States. Uh, I'd say what I'd say on par with biological weapons. James Dyson, you're saying, how will the Chinese balloon crisis play into the 2024 elections? 
Will the Pentagon be implicated for apparent corruption? Would Donald Trump use this as a platform element in his campaign? A um, few points on this when it comes to how will the Chinese balloon crisis play of the 2024 election? It's going to be a major talking point for the Republicans and for Trump, kind of answering the last one here as well. Trump Trump will use anything he anything on the table, uh, any kind of point, any kind of pressure point, he'll always punch it. He likes to hit those soft spots. Uh, anything that makes his adversaries look incompetent, anything he can call them names over, uh, he will very often bring them up. It's very likely not going to be a leading issue he has, uh, but it is very, almost without a doubt, going to be one of his big talking points. Um, Republicans are probably going to use this in a couple ways, which ties into the second part of this question, which is, will the Pentagon be implicated for apparent corruption? The Republican narrative is going to be the politicization of our government, the weaponization of government, which the House Republicans are now making a committee, they've already started actually, investigating how the Department of Justice is targeting American patriots. How, for example, people going to protest at abortion clinics are having federal agents, FBI agents, show up at their doors for, for pre-dawn raids. Remember, there was an old man who had 30 FBI agents uh, raid his home after he protested in an abortion clinic. I think he pushed somebody. Um, why parents are being investigated for going to their school board meetings when there's no evidence, no, no submitted evidence of any kind of criminal complaints or anything like that, but the teachers' unions are going to, you know, the Biden administration and asking the asking the Biden administration to launch a politicized investigation over what are political discussions and, frankly, things that are part of our normal election system. Again, school boards are elected positions, and in many cases, um, frankly, targeting people politically could even constitute election interference from the very people who say protecting democracy and warning about the end of democracy. Um, they're trying to dis disable people from participating in the democratic system of elections by doing that. Uh, the, the Pentagon's withholding of information from Trump, the Pentagon's um, apparent overriding even of Biden to some extent in this case, uh, where they were the ones saying don't shoot and were saying they were making the call when that's the commander in chief, the president's call. Uh, there's a lot of why why were they able to detect it? Were they lying about it? Did they knowingly withhold information from Trump? Were they communicating behind the scenes with the Chinese Communist Party during such a case, which would be in serious national security the security risk to America? Uh, these are questions that need to be answered about the Pentagon and their behavior. Uh, that the that the Republicans are going to be using, and because it's looking to the politicization of the government, this is going to be looking specifically at political bias leaning in favor of the Democrats, of uh, the Justice Department, the Department of Defense, and others. And this is going to be one of the topics they talk about with that. So absolutely, you're going to be seeing this, this play a big role uh, in political discussions going forward. John Bates, you're saying, um, Will, sorry, what do you think about the Republican idea to have a fixed 25% 20, tax to abolish the IRS. Um, okay, well, this is getting into like my personal opinion. Uh, personally, I don't like I don't like income tax. I think it is not traditional. Well, in some countries it was, but I, I don't think in the United States it was ever necessary. I think it has resulted in the just just ballooning of our government, frankly. Uh, into way into areas it should have never been involved with. My idea of government is that it should not be basically trying to control every part of our lives. Uh, I like government basically as a, as a system to moderate international conflicts, to do diplomatic operations, and to basically maintain some basic system of law. Um, I'm very much in line politically with the original founding doctrines of the United States and the limited form of government that we had. Um, I think the IRS is unconstitutional, I do not think it should exist, and I believe that income tax also should not exist in the United States. That being said, I'm not like an anarchist or something like that, I do believe that some taxes are necessary, and I do believe that part of the social contract necessitates the ability of the government to be able to gain, you know, pay its costs somehow. Um, I think the original system of using tariffs on foreign countries and so on as a way to pay for that was a very good system. 
Um, although I'm aware there were other types of taxes as well, some of which, some of which I agree with, some of which I disagree with. Back to the issue of the 23% tax, um, I think it would be great because it would give incentive to the government to allow for, in, for good trade programs. It would give incentive to the government to make sure that they're not interfering with the economy because if the economy does poorly, it means that the government's coffers don't do so well either. It would mean that the, the, the budget of the federal government would very closely be determined by the stability of the market. And there, there, there'd be some pros and cons to that. For example, if a war were to break out and the international economy was disrupted, uh, or even the local economy was disrupted, or if there was a major crisis that would affect the basic ability of the government to function, right? There are some issues with it, but there are ways around that, as we've seen historically. At the same time, folks, I think I'm, I'm in Jersey right now. I'm actually recording from home. I think we pay like a like a 17% sales tax. You know, we pay a 7% sales tax already, right? I'm I'm paying right now 7% sales tax if I buy anything here as it is. I would easily triple that to not have to pay income tax um personally. If I go to a restaurant, I'm paying, you know, 20% tip on on any kind of purchase and now they want you to pay tips on everything. That means 27% roughly, you know, I'm paying in addition to what's on the what's on the normal price tag uh, through the between the government and everything else. Personally, I would be will I would be willing to pay 23% and not have to pay taxes. I would go for it personally. Um, at the same time, too, um, it would at the same time, too, you know, if you look at not just that but even just the way income tax works i'm paying i believe like 20 percent of my pay 20 percent not not even not even 20 percent of what i buy but 20 percent of everything i make in taxes and so i personally would be paying less in taxes for this you know i think it was 23 percent, not 25 percent, but i can't it, it, there were some different debates on it right let me explain that again right now if you, if I mean, I guess depending on what state you're, because I know some states don't have income tax at all. Like if I think you're in Florida and some parts of it. Um, if 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 for example you're in some parts of the U.S. where you have to pay twenty percent or even more of your taxes, uh, even more of your money on taxes, that means you're already paying almost that much, right? You're paying almost already that much, and again. You know, you're not you're probably not spending your entire paycheck every month on buying stuff. You're probably saving some. You're probably using it for other things like rent or bills. I don't know if that'd be 23 percent tax in addition to that. Uh, but rather than pay tax on your entire income, you're paying tax only on the income you're spending. It's roughly the same. I think it's a good idea personally, but um, I think I think at the very mo at the very least it's opening up debate on alternatives to the current tax system, which I think is a a good discussion to have. Uh, last question from Zanul uh, Flame Singer: You're saying, if we are so concerned about security, why do we allow CCP members to become employees of sensitive technology companies? We can easily follow the money, like in Canada, Dr. Tam gave seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to CCP last year. Um, well, you know, that has to do with the open system of America. The Soviet Union, for example, back during the Cold War, talked about how they were exploiting the open system of the United States. The Chinese Communist Party, under its United, United Front Work Department, um, would say they're doing the same thing. They're exploiting the open nature of the United States. Um, the phrase, the, the slogan they have for this is, strangle you with your own systems. Manipulate the open systems manipulate the programs we have, the ability to start businesses here, the ability to get around sanctions, the ability to have people immigrate and then open things domestically, to manipulate uh, the open system we have here that just has its doors flung you know, wide for everybody to come in, manipulate that strategically to undermine us from within. Uh, the CCP has programs designed specifically to do that and you know, there are some issues with that. I know that if you were to apply for a green card in the United States or citizenship, there is still a question on that that says, are you or have you ever been a member of a communist party? The reality is people just lie about it. There are plenty of CCP members, 
people I've met um, who lie about that because it, they don't, nobody takes it seriously in America, right? Um, it is unfortunate, and unfortunately, there are pretty much anybody involved in high-level business or government, um, high-level business or academia coming out of the Chinese Communist Party is going to be, out of China, is going to be a Communist Party member, and that's just the way it is. And so, they're not treated as security threats in the way I think they should be with that type of affiliation. Um, look, if you, if you were to travel to another country and you were a member of, like, um, let's say, you know, the government in some way, uh, that you're involved in security services or you take an oath to, like, give your life and blood to defend, like, whatever branch you're part of, uh, most countries would see you as at least something to monitor as a potential threat. And so I think it's it's very it, it would it would be within legitimate territory to treat CCP members or former CCP members with some degree of caution. Although, again, it's not absolute because a lot of people are just coerced to join. And so it's again, it's not absolute. I know plenty of people who have quit the Communist Party of China, uh, who've stated their withdrawals and who are very much opposed to it and are good people. And so again, it's not just a black and white issue. All right, folks. That said. Um, tune in tomorrow. I'll actually be traveling again I'm in the process of filming a documentary again. Something good to tell you all about. Uh, so I will see you tomorrow. I'll be on the road again, but at 1030 a.m. Eastern Time, we're going to talk about the cartels operating inside the United States and carrying out some really horrific crimes. And I'll tell you some of the causes of the ability of the cartels to be able to now function within the American heartland and what that means for us. Uh, it's going to be an important episode, so don't miss it. Tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, folks, please share this episode. Again, it's all grassroots here. Those of you on YouTube, thank you for being here. And folks I, on Epic TV, I apologize for the issues we had today. Um, I don't think we've had this happen before, so I do apologize again. That said, folks, thank you so much for being here. And as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you. The greatest threat facing the United States is the CCP. The Epic Times investigation team had studied the CCP for years, but what we uncovered was yielding evidence beyond our imagination. With Chairman Mao, with the Prime Minister, our talks have been characterized by frankness. The Clinton administration said, oh, don't worry about it. This will be a poison pill for China. China's strategic goal is to make sure that the U.S. has four enemies, and one of them must be a terrorist group. We are giving of our life's blood so that the Chinese Communist Party can survive and thrive.